Hello everyone, this is Paul Keith Davis with a uh, video blog today. It's been quite a while since I've actually done a video blog. I have done quite a number of podcasts, that's been our focus at least for me and Amy and I of course have done uh, our live table meetings on Sunday evening. So we've done quite a bit of that kind of media releases but haven't done a blog in a couple of months so I'm happy to come to you today and share a little prophetic message I've been given. The focus of what I've been sharing on the podcast over, uh, over the last several months has been the book of Revelation. I did 20 podcasts on the seven thunders, and I won't go too much into that, but uh, except to say what we do know about the seven thunders, the effect they will have, the seven thunders of Revelation 10, when the Lord sets His feet on the land and the sea like pillars of fire. Oh, what a day. And He has the seven-sealed book that is now open, the open scroll. And there's a cry, there shall be delay no longer. And the mysteries are going to be revealed. And John said he heard the seven thunders utter their voices, but was told not to write them, but to seal them up. Well, the day has come, <laughs> I believe. We are approaching the time when those seven thunders are going to utter forth those mysteries of the kingdom that will be tremendous revelatory truth that will be found in the Word of God to prepare us for the coming of the Lord. I believe we have crossed a threshold in the timeline of God. You know, Israel, the fig tree, putting forth her buds way back in 1948, started the clock ticking. And of course, 1967, there was an even greater emphasis as, it, as the nation of Israel was being reborn, a prophetic fulfillment that only God could have pulled off. But that was our indicator that things are moving in that direction. Now, here we are, you know, well into the 21st century. And we are very close, I believe, to this moment of human history when the Lord is going to begin to fulfill what I have been teaching lately is His Omega ministry. I did 20 podcasts on the seven thunders and I've actually recorded 33 total. So the last 13 podcasts um, have been on Revelation chapter 1, this amazing chapter of the Bible where we see the Lord in His glory. He's resurrected from the dead. He ascends to the Father. He receives a new name. And John, this man that was the most familiar with the Lord, clearly is caught up to heaven. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That phrase, on the Lord's day, is very important. I want to lay a little foundation here before I share a message, a little message that I feel like the Lord has given us for right now. But he was in the Spirit, and of course he saw the Lord standing among the seven golden lampstands, heard the Lord's voice behind him like the sound of many waters. And when John turned to see, there was the Lord standing there in the sevenfold revelation of his glory, his hair as white as wool like snow, his face uh, shining like the sun at noonday. His eyes were like flames of fire. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. He was clothed in a white robe with a golden sash, and his feet looked like burnished bronze when it's been made to glow in a furnace. Can you imagine the sight? And even, even John, this man that laid his head on the Lord's breast, fell to the ground like a dead man. Oh, my goodness. In that same chapter, the Lord says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Very important phrase. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The one who was and is and is to come. The Almighty. I've taken that one scripture and I've built around it probably six or seven podcasts that you can listen to if you like on the White Dove Ministries app and also on our table meetings. But for the purpose of this blog, I want to talk just a little bit about this omega time. There's the alpha time, the omega time, the beginning and the end. 
You know, there's multiple ways we can apply that. You know, we can look at the early church, the first century church as an omega church. And we can look at the last day church as, I'm sorry, the first age alpha church, the last days omega. Uh, you can even look at that as Genesis alpha, the end of the age when the Lord returns for his bride as the omega. However you want to apply that, I'm, I'm going to kind of work with that phrase alpha and omega in the context of the church age. With the early church being the alpha ministry, the end of the age, the generation in which we're living right now, the timeline we have entered being the omega. The omega, and I believe the omega can take us right into the millennial age, the kingdom age. The omega ministry, you know, we see this, this paradigm, we see this context that's given to us in the scriptures where it says, um, the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former, okay? Uh, in the context of that phrase, that the glory of the omega ministry will be even greater than the alpha ministry. The, 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 um, the, the former reign and the latter reign, alpha and omega, the latter reign, as we know, agriculturally, is seven times greater than the former reign. So from this context, we can come to the conclusion that what the Lord does at the end of the age will be even greater than what he did at the beginning. I believe the scriptures support that wholeheartedly. The Lord's not going to let the devil have the last word. Oh, I know there's darkness out there and it's going to get darker in the world. But I tell you what, the Lord is about to reveal himself. He's about to make a statement. <laughs> The Lord is going to end this age with an exclamation mark. There will be a revelation of His glory. He is going to demonstrate His resurrection power. I believe it with all of my heart. It is the whole purpose of what Amy and I do today is to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord to be a part of this, this Omega ministry, this grand finale this consummation of the ages as we come to the end of the church age and move into what is the kingdom age. At the end of this age, there will be the resurrection of the dead and the translation of the living saints when the Lord, you know, the Lord will come to us to empower us. That's the coming of the Lord, Matthew 24, the parousia, to empower His bride and His sons to to demonstrate the kingdom, to exemplify resurrection power on the earth. Jesus said in Matthew 13, the end of the age is the harvest. And it will be with a grand display of the glory and power of God. I believe it with every ounce of my being. And I believe the scriptures support it. You can even go back into Zechariah chapter 4 where Zerubbabel is a type of Christ and the glory and the hands that laid the foundation of the church in the early age will be the glory that brings the capstone at the end of the age, but with shouts of grace, grace, the greater grace, the greatest grace, <laughs> the culmination, the omega, the Lord revealing himself. There's so many things I'd love to share right now on this point, but for the sake of time, I would just encourage you to go back and listen to the podcast. But the Lord has a new name, the Bible tells us. And when you overcome the systems of this world, the beast system and the number of His name, you overcome that false counterfeit religious system, the Lord says He will write His name upon you, His new name, Revelation 3.12. And I believe that new name gives us access to great end-of-the-age privileges. You know, back in Daniel, when uh, he received this great revelation from Gabriel, in Daniel chapter 12, he talks about it. But he talks about the, these revelations being concealed until the time of the end, the time of Omega, the Omega time, the Omega time, the end of the age. These greatest revelations will be revealed and all that was ordained to be released to humanity before the coming of the Lord will be unleashed on the earth to empower the people to wash the bride. The bride will make herself ready 
in the undiluted revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she will be presented to him in glory and honor. She's not going to be some weak, sick, over, sick overcome bride. She will be victorious. She will be an overcomer. She will be clothed in garments of glory. And the Lord Himself will come into her in, in fullness, not just earnest, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, but in fullness to display Himself to planet Earth and bring in this great harvest. That's where I believe we are. That's just a little quick synopsis of where we are. Now, with that foundation laid, I want to just talk very quickly, you know, about something. I've been meditating on Ezekiel 36, and of course, without me having to take a lot of time, people that watch us know that there are dual applications to these prophetic scriptures, you know, when it, as it relates to Israel as a nation and the, uh, that we are the Israel of God, as Paul says. He is a Jew who is one inwardly in circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit. And if you are in Christ, you are the seed of Abraham. We are the Israel of God, the book of Galatians. So we know there is this application that applies to us as well. But here is the message I feel like the Lord is, is saying, at least to me, I believe it has corporate application as well as we move into this new season. I'm going to start with verse 23 first out of Ezekiel 36, and it says, And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. Well, let me go back. I'm going to go start at verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord. Oh, I, I love that phrase when it's really him. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name. Okay, I'm just going to pause there. And remember, I, I, may, I mentioned that after the resurrection from the dead, the, in His glory and His power and majesty, He ascends to the right hand of the Father. This amazing Messiah, this God that left the glory that He had with the Father to become a man, to live the life of a human being, but on the inside of that fleshly body was the glory and attributes and invisible the invisible attributes and the divine nature of God. He was God, but He was also in human form. And He suffered. He became hungry and all the various things that we experience as human beings, being touched by the feeling of our infirmities, He says, and so forth. And so He, uh, he allowed Himself to be butchered at the hands of His own creation. Then He ascends to the Father after His resurrection and He receives a new name. So we have the name of Yeshua, Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, but then he has a new name. And that new name is written upon those that overcome, Revelation 3.12. All right, now, with that in mind, follow this, this verse. It is not for your sake, o, o house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. I, I believe we as a corporate church and all the various denominations and organizations and belief structures and, and all the variety of things that have gone on, we haven't done a very good job of representing the Lord. Let's just be honest about it. We're, we're not in great shape right now on, as a corporate level. There might be a remnant of people scattered throughout that are living in some measure of the Lord's uh, glory and so forth. But it's not on a corporate level. We have to be honest and do a, an accurate evaluation. The corporate church is not in good shape. There is a lot of apostasy. There is a lot of unbelief. There is a lot of corruption. There is a lot of idolatry. Don't be mad at me, please. I'm just trying to get us to the place where those things come out of us. It says, which you have profaned among them, and the nations will know that I am the Lord. Let me go back and reread verse 23 without the commentary. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate 
my holiness before their eyes. Through you, I vindicate my holiness. Now, I know there's many names the Lord has been given. But those names are captured in the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah. And now we know He has a new name that is written upon these overcomers. And in that name is the life of God. In that name is the holiness of God. And He said, I'm going to display the holiness of my name one more time on planet earth and I'm going to do it through you. Now my deal is, Lord, let me be a part of it. Let me be a part of it. And I believe right now people are either being qualified or disqualified to be a part of that. You know, back in Numbers chapter 14, we read about Israel coming out of Egypt and there was a separation of those that qualified to go into this great promise and those that were disqualified. That's the only way to look at it. But it says in Numbers 14, I think around maybe verse 24 or so, that Caleb qualified. He qualified to vindicate the holiness of God's name, let's say, because he had a different spirit. He had a different spirit. You can go back and read it for yourself. I'm just kind of referencing that right now for the sake of time. And what I have heard the Lord saying is that as we repent, <laughs> which, you know, I've been doing a lot of myself, Lord, whatever is in my life that might stand in the way of what's going on, please help me. I'm sorry. Forgive me. My, my wife and I both, she have been praying this prayer. Forgive me. And this is what I believe the Lord is going to do. I will sprinkle clean water upon you. Those that are crying out to be a part of this great display of the holiness of the Lord's name, those that desire from the depths of their soul, from an honest and sincere heart, not for selfish motivation, but from an honest and sincere heart, desiring to see the Lord get the full measure of His reward. And we cry out for that. The Lord says, okay. I'm going to sprinkle clean water upon you. I'm going to wash away all the filth. Let me just read it. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all of your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. Listen to this. And I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you, cause you to walk according to my statutes. Then you will be careful to observe my ways. Oh my goodness. Okay. Here is my prophetic message for us today. I believe the Lord is saying, if we will posture ourselves before him right now, first he'll cleanse us. Wash away the residue of this world and idolatry, the things we've embraced to be the truth that are not. And He will then give us a new heart and a new spirit. And this was the message the Lord spoke to me last week when I began to do the table meeting, our table meeting on Sunday evening. He said, tell the people if they'll cry out, I'll take away the spirit of fear and give them a spirit of courage. I'll take away the spirit of anxiety and I'll give them a spirit of peace. I'll, I'll remove from them the spirit of heaviness and I'll put upon them the spirit of joy. I believe we can have a transference of that we can get a new spirit. You know, I love it when they say, well, he has a real spirit of courage. <laughs> or, or, you know, there's, there's, the Lord is the one. It actually says this in Isaiah 42. I had a big angel. <laughs> I don't mean to make light of that, but every time I think about this experience, it just, I remember it. I can still see it. It happened in 1992. But this really big, angelic created being stood next to my chair and gave me this passage. But it says Isaiah 42 5, thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. He gives us our spirit. 
what makes us who we are and, and our, you know, it, 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 it influences how we approach life. It, it influences everything that we do. And you know, the good news is He can take out the uh, Spirit in us that we may have lived with our entire lives and replace it with a Spirit that is conducent to Himself. And I believe that's what's going on right now. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Now I realize people use this when we get saved, we get, you know, we, we're born again and all old things pass away, everything becomes new. But if you and I are honest with ourselves, there are Christians that are born again, but we have still dealt with issues of fear or anxiety or oppression or whatever the course the case may be. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me last week and He said, tell them if they'll cry out, I'll, I'll give them a spirit of courage. I'll give them a spirit of boldness. I'll even give them a spirit of faith, a spirit of revelation, these things that we need to move into this new season. So that's my prophetic message for you in this particular video blog, that He is about to do something. We only have, I don't know how many years we've got left, but I believe we have entered that span of time when the Lord is revealing Himself as the Omega. All of these Omega prophecies, the day of the Lord, the end of the age, the harvest, and all these numerous dozens and dozens of scriptures in the Bible that relate to this very last generation that are on the earth during and after the return of the Lord. So, Lord, I pray that you would grant that to us. I'll pray for myself. Lord, give me a new heart and a new spirit. You know, I've even, the Lord has been dealing with my physical heart, and he's also dealing with our spiritual heart. Lord, burn away, if you will, all of the residual influences of this world. Burn away any characteristics or attributes that are not consistent with the nature and character of God and give us a new heart and a new spirit. A spirit like you gave Caleb, a, a man with a different spirit. He wasn't influenced by the unbelief of those around him. He was not intimidated. He was not intimidated by, by others that wanted to go back into Egypt or were unwilling to stand on the Word of God. He, he, he made his stand on God's Word because he had a different spirit. Give us a spirit like that. That's my prayer, Lord. And I pray it for everyone who is watching this blog. Grant that to us by your grace, I ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.